Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to r slash malicious compliance. Where in this episode, rude neighbors are repeatedly calling cops, Karens are getting their husbands to beat people up, and road raging Karens are getting what they deserve. It's gonna be a super satisfying one, so strap yourselves in, kick your feet up, and enjoy. Also, subscribe if you haven't, and hey, now you can listen on Spotify, so check out the links below. So this happened about two years ago. I should mention that I'm tatted up and I do have weird hair. And my neighbor is ultra religious and extra conservative. Now it's a beautiful fall day and I take the opportunity to do some gardening. To get my plants ready for winter. I realize my pruning shears are rusted shut because silly me left them out in the elements. So I go and grab a kitchen knife that I never use and start chopping away at my plants. My neighbor, let's call her Miss Meanie, sees me working, and decides to come and have a chat. She informs me that the knife I'm using, a 12-inch thin kitchen knife, is very threatening and dangerous looking, and if I don't stop using it, she's gonna call the cops. I reassure her that I'm only using it to prune my plants. Now Miss Meanie decides that me chopping up my dead leaves equals terroristic threats, and she goes on and calls the police. So the police show up and I explain the situation, and they laugh. They tell me that maybe to ease the tension, I should probably get a new pruning tool. So enter malicious compliance. I go to my local hardware store and go in the garden center and find the biggest and baddest machete that they legally sell. The machete is 24 inches long and about 5 inches tall. Now don't hate on my measurement description, just envision a huge machete. I leave feeling confident that I won't anger anybody anymore. So I start chopping away with my new garden friend, and Miss Meanie's appalled at what she's seeing. A massacre of dead growth and tree limbs lay at my feet, and she yells from her window in a scared voice, You are going to jail, before she calls the cops. Again, the cops show up, and the same officer arrives, laughing even harder than before. He tells her that I am technically using a garden tool, and no threat can be found. She moved out shortly after, and now I can use my baby. I call her Machetta. So it totally sounds like OP's neighbor needs to get a hobby or something, right? So this person shares their comment and says, Our hedge cutters broke once and my mom let me use a katana. Our neighbors just laughed. See, these are the types of neighbors you want to live by. As long as OP isn't putting anyone or themselves in danger, let them cut plants with whatever they want. If I were OP, I would have grabbed a scythe and started doing my gardening in a Grim Reaper costume and watched my neighbor's head explode, right? I've been working bar security as a bouncer at the same bar for about three years. Now, if you ever want to know what it's like to be a bouncer, think daycare, but at night. And instead of small children, it's adults who revert to children when intoxicated or even when not intoxicated. Anywho, this night is much like any other night. There's a popular local band playing, so we've got a decent crowd going. The team is keeping their eyes open for anybody passed out, being belligerent, drugs, the works. I'm standing by the door to the bar area of the building. The way this place works, it's basically cut in half, with one half being the pool hall and the other half being the bar slash entertainment area, separated by a wall with a door either end. I stand by this door a lot because I can easily keep track of both rooms at the same time without needing to really walk around the place. So there's a gentleman sitting near the door where I'm at, and there's a couple sitting at the bar across the way. The female is a regular, and she's well known for acting out and being really entitled when she's drunk. A Karen, if you may. From what we could see on the cameras inside, she walks over to the gentleman by the door, and starts trying to flirt with him. Now, this guy has come into the bar for years, and he's never raised a hand to anybody, for any reason. He's a professionally trained boxer doesn't drink himself stupid, doesn't generally close out the bar, and he's a good patron, just looking to have a good night out with friends. He rejects her advances, and she becomes noticeably upset. She then proceeds to run to her husband and tell him that the guy disrespected her and called her names. You can see the man get furious, as who wouldn't if the wife's being called names. The gentleman ushers her man over and kindly asks him to make this woman leave him alone. Before the conversation starts though, the husband grabs the guy by the collar and starts driving him towards the wall. Chaos ensues as they didn't realize that he came with 20 friends and he's a boxer so he knows how to defend himself. I watched as he quickly gets out of the man's grasp, throws a couple of jabs at the husband and the woman because she decided she wanted in this brawl. The dude hits her so hard that he literally knocks out a few teeth. This all happens in the span of about 10 seconds, so the security team jumps in and gets everybody separated. The husband and wife get taken outside, but we haven't called the cops, because generally, that's a last resort. 
So we're outside, the lady's bleeding from her mouth, and the husband's visibly angry, screaming at everybody. She keeps asking me to call the cops, but I keep telling her that's a bad idea considering the husband put his hands on the guy first, and we have cameras to prove it, but she's not having it. She's screaming at me to call police before she gets me fired, so I do exactly what she says, and I call police. Now, I can't describe how difficult it was not to laugh in the lady's face as she witnessed the cops put her husband in handcuffs, and not the guy who punched her. She then said something I'll never forget, and I wish I had it on camera. She screams, This is why we don't call the effing cops. This is your fault. I very nonchalantly reminded her that that was her idea to call police in the first place. I didn't see them again until about a year later. She had to get her whole bottom row of teeth pretty much fixed, and she hasn't changed in the slightest. What a night though. Yeah guys, I don't even know what to say to this. Like, I don't want to say she deserved getting her teeth knocked out, but if you're that entitled where you flirt with someone and you get turned down, and then you <laughs> and then you make up lies and tell your husband that someone badmouthed you so he can go beat the living snot out of that person, you kind of deserve the karma that comes your way, right? Like, I did originally feel bad for the husband because he got all riled up because of her lies, and he got beat up by that. But then I remembered that there's never a good reason to aggressively approach someone just out of nowhere, grab them by the collar, and try to throw them up against the wall. I mean, unless they were beating up puppies or something, but that's a different story altogether, guys. So this story happened just a few hours ago. I was driving a semi down the highway when the traffic suddenly became bumper to bumper on a two lane due to an accident a couple of miles ahead. Everybody was creeping and I was in the right lane. Suddenly, I saw a regular vehicle, not even an emergency vehicle, on my right side, which was the shoulder lane, passing me. Now, there's not even an exit nearby, and I was like, heck no. And as soon as I saw a couple of vehicles behind me trying to do the same thing, I immediately blocked them by going slightly to the shoulder so I'm occupying two lanes. Now, I did get a few honks, but I couldn't care less. If I'm suffering in a traffic jam, everyone should too as well. The shoulder isn't for passing. As long as I didn't see flashing lights behind me, I'm not opening that shoulder. We're crawling anyway. After a few hundred feet ahead, I see an idle police cruiser on the shoulder up ahead. I figured that nobody would dare use the shoulder anymore, and I merged back into my lane. It turns out I was right. The shoulder became empty all of a sudden, but that's not the end. So while I was chilling, still creeping, I heard a very annoying and repetitive honk to my left side. I look over and see this lady with huge sunglasses, ponytail, bending down on her seat, looking at me, yelling something, and looking outraged. I roll down my window and this is the following conversation. Karen says, You know you're blocking two lanes, right? Now I was confused and said, Huh? I was right behind you on the right lane and you wouldn't move. I honked and you didn't care. I told her, That's a shoulder. You're not supposed to drive on the shoulder. Karen says, that's a lane! You're allowed to drive there. While she's still yelling incoherently, we're still slowly moving. And then I remembered, there's an idle police cruiser on the shoulder that I saw a while back that we didn't pass yet. And I'm sure everybody knows by now, malicious compliance initiated. I reduce my speed even more, so Karen's faster than me by a little bit on the left lane. Then I dare her by giving her the signal that she can pass me to use the shoulder. She aggressively took it, cut in front of me, and immediately went to the shoulder. However, what Karen didn't know is that the cruiser's already around the corner. I was driving a semi, so my field of vision is much higher and wider than everybody else. Karen was driving a sedan. Her field of vision is much lower and limited. Now, what I didn't take into account was how aggressive Karen was driving. She cut the corner so quick without looking, she ended up hitting the cruiser. It was so abrupt that I could hear the crash pretty loudly. I can also tell that the driver in front of me was gasping in shock as well. Now I've never seen an officer get out of the cruiser so fast before. The dude practically jumps out of the cruiser in less than a second. And this is what I witnessed and heard when I'm creeping by slowly with traffic. Not wanting to miss anything, I roll down my passenger window and I hear, Get out of the vehicle! I see Karen still inside the car, full fluster mode. And the officer screams at her again, Get out now! Karen finally gets out, and literally, word for word, she says, But I wasn't at fault. You were stopping on a lane, officer. The officer says to her, This is a shoulder for emergency, not for convenience to escape the traffic jam. I can hear Karen stammering, and she's telling some incoherent sob story. 
as I drove away from the scene. I couldn't hear what's going on anymore, but I kept watching my front as well as the side mirror. Judging from her body movement, she was indeed panicking while pointing at my truck. I don't know why. Then, before the scene disappeared from my mirror, the last thing I saw was the officer pulling out handcuffs and cuffing Karen. Surprisingly, she complied without causing any more scenes. Then I continued to drive into the sunset. Guys, I only wish there was a video of this, but sadly, OP says his company's too cheap to install dash cams in their vehicles. But that's the perfect instant karma for an impatient driver, right? That Karen totally deserved it. Now with that said though, there are a lot of people giving OP grief for blocking the shoulder and being petty in the traffic jam though, as you never know who needs it for an emergency, right? Thankfully in this case, it sounds like Karen was just impatient, but you never know what people are going through. So this story happened in the early 2000s. I had a chance meeting with an old friend who reminded me of the story. Now just for clarification's sake, I had an accident, which left me with a long road to recover personal mobility. At the time, I lived in a third story Victorian era apartment, so I bought a ranch style house that was better suited to my recovery. The house was a three bedroom, two and a half bathroom detached garage, and by my opinion, a rather ugly shade of yellow. My girlfriend at the time took the opportunity to move in with me, and beyond family, I had two regular visitors, a personal trainer and an aide. So for argument's sake, I can't say that everything leading up to the malicious compliance was brought on by a single neighbor, but at the very least, if I had a fire, she was pouring gasoline on it. I quite quickly met two of my neighbors upon moving in. The two couldn't be any more opposite if they tried. One neighbor, Al, an old biker, whom everybody should have a neighbor like once in their lives. And the other was Wilma, a nosy neighbor extraordinaire. The rest of the neighborhood was a great blend of ages, ethnicities, families, and not. Just good people doing the best they could. So things started off on the wrong foot. Or, more appropriately, wheel with Wilma. Right off the bat, she made it clear that she was the type of person to personally inspect anything you did to your house. And she did not mind telling you if something wasn't up to her standards. Which included my old 69 Chevy truck. She clearly thought it was ugly. For some reason though, Wilma loved my girlfriend and she would talk at length to her. My girlfriend didn't share the same feelings for Wilma. Al, on the other hand, being a gearhead, quickly decided that I was his new best friend. Looking back, I'm glad Al was there. I'm not sure if I ever told him, but he always had a way to pick me up, even on my worst days. Anyways, problems amounted fairly quickly. I had hired a contractor because we were in the process of renovating the house and I wanted to make some modifications. We were nearly constantly hit with inspections and stop work orders. It was clear that someone was complaining, and more often than not, Wilma seemed to be in the know about what the inspection was for. I remember one day, my contractor called the police because she was constantly on site and butting in. After that day, she'd stand on the sidewalk watching everything. Shortly after construction ended came rumors that I was cheating on my girlfriend. Then came rumors that I was having a gay affair. Now to be fair, I don't know who or what buff biff my trainer was into. Now of course, the gay rumor spurred the local church flyers and occasional visits to attempt to save me. Nikki, my aide, tried to put on a good face, but she was clearly bothered by it, and that pissed us all off. Come one day, Al had enough, and he confronted the church member as they were walking up to the house. Now it wasn't anything physical, but it was loud enough with an open window to hear Al let them know that we all had enough. Wilma called the cops, but at least that harassment stopped. From that day on, it seems that I either had the city or police knocking on my door all the time. If Al took me for a ride in my pickup, cops were called. If I was in my garage and dropped a wrench after 10pm, cops were called. If I had friends over and we were boisterous after dark, the cops were called. If my truck wasn't parked by whoever I let drive it in my garage at night, the city was called. If my grass was a touch shaggy, the city was called. Nikki's fiancé came over and planted some flowers for me, and yep, the city comes and visits, and I had to have my yard rearranged. All the while, somehow Wilma seemed to know everything about what's going on. So one evening, we had a bad storm. In the storm, a large branch fell off the oak in my yard and ripped off several rows of siding. Sure enough, the city comes knocking as my contractor's cleaning up the branches. I ended up with a notice to repair the siding on the house or face penalties. Now, we couldn't get the same siding, and to be honest, I was a bit excited to get rid of that ugly yellow, at least on the front of the house. My contractor made some emergency patches to the siding while we were supposed to decide on what to do. Of course, this brought Wilma out, who informed us all that the city code required a uniform appearance of the house. And Wilma was not a fan of my siding. I stated that I think the house would look good in a tan color. 
she was trying to steer me back to yellow because my second choice was white, and that would have been too many white houses in a row in her opinion. So cue the malicious compliance. I confirmed with the city that yes, the house had to have a uniform appearance, which meant that I would have to at least paint the rest of the house to match the front, and that was really the only restriction. Somehow during this time, I found out that Wilma absolutely hated the color fuchsia, so I proceeded to tell my contractor to paint the house fuchsia. So it just so happened that Wilma was away the week that my house was repaired and painted. So upon her return, she wasted no time coming over to demand that we paint it a different color. My girlfriend looks her straight in the eye and said something to the effect of, it's such a lovely color and certainly wakes up the neighborhood. And Wilma stormed off. So the aftermath. This was more or less the end of our direct conversations with Wilma. She did call the city who came out and gave us the blessing to keep the color. And she did complain about the hideous house across the street to our neighbors. The officers were also more or less done with her harassment towards us. Now I'm not sure what they said, or if they even said anything, but there was a definite reduction in visits. About a year later, Wilma suffered a heart attack, which she survived. But then she decided to move closer to her children. I moved out a year after that, and I found out via said friend that the house is still fuchsia. Guys, talk about living beside a nightmare neighbor, right? I'd be driven crazy by the woman if I were OP. And painting the house a color that she hates is the ultimate petty revenge on top of a malicious compliance though, right? This malicious compliance was on the part of my mom. It was almost 19 years ago now, but I thought you all might find it mildly amusing. I'm sure there's similar stories of parents doing the same thing. Now warning, this is long and rambling, so feel free to skip the details if you don't need the background. My youngest brother was lazy when he was in his early teens. This occurred during summer break from school. Our parents required us to be in bed by 10pm on weekdays and even during breaks from school, since our dad has to leave for work at 5.30am. This had been a rule for years. My mom was a stay-at-home mom who busted her ass doing household stuff for all of us that she didn't have to do, but she enjoyed seeing her family happy. My little brother had recently had his 14th birthday a couple of days before, and was lucky enough to be gifted an Xbox and two games that he very much wanted. In our family, this was a big deal because our parents, while not poor, weren't exactly flush with money, and had saved up for it by cutting coupons and cutting back on luxuries that they enjoyed. One day during this break, my 14-year-old brother was up playing his newly acquired Xbox, and hadn't gotten ready for bed yet, and it was coming up on 10pm. Now I was already in bed reading a book. My mom tells my brother that he has to go to bed and to please turn off the game. Suddenly, the Xbox seems to be the reason that he didn't like the rules anymore. Mom, looking very annoyed at my ungrateful brother, tells him it's not an option, that he has to go to bed now. My little brother says, but why does he get to stay up? That's not fair. He as in me, his college-age brother. My mom tells him, because he's an adult, that's why, and you're going to bed this instant. My little brother puts up a fight and says, no. Stop treating me like a kid. I'm not a little kid anymore. Now I can see my mom get a funny look on her face. She smiles and I have no idea what's going on at this point and I'm pretty surprised. Because usually at this point she'd bring down the sanctions hammer and possibly take away the Xbox. But she doesn't. She simply says, okay. She then goes to the kitchen and I can see her whisper something to dad but I'm too far away to hear. Dad goes into the garage where he keeps his woodworking stuff and returns with earplugs in his hand, and our parents go to bed. I had to sleep almost an hour later, and my brother is still gaming away. The next morning, my little brother doesn't get up until just before noon and has some cereal. Then dinner time comes, and mom's made eggplant casserole. My brother hates eggplants. Now normally she'd make something else for him, but not this time. My little brother says, where's my food? To which my mom says, oh, there are some ingredients in the pantry for you to make dinner with. My brother ends up eating cereal again because he can't figure out what he's supposed to do. A few days later, he's got no clean clothes left and he says, Mom, I have nothing to wear. Now at this point, Mom's smiling like the Cheshire Cat and she says, I usually do my laundry on Fridays. Which day would you like to use the laundry machine? My little brother says, But, but Mom, what? Mom then says, How about Saturdays? They're usually free that day. And oh look, today's Saturday. Feel free to use them. She then walks out of the room to go lay on the patio and read. As she goes through the kitchen, she passes my dad, and they both laugh. My brother continues to wear his clothes saturated with teenage stank instead. At dinner, my parents announce that they're taking us to a matinee showing on Sunday morning, of Terminator, the third one. My brother really wanted to go. My mom said we'd like to go at 10am for the 10.30 showing, 
Well, my brother stayed up super late again playing Xbox, and it was almost time to leave, and my brother still wasn't awake. Now normally, our mom would have asked him to go to bed at midnight on a weekend, but dear malicious compliance mom decided that she didn't feel like stressing herself out arguing with him. As we're putting our shoes on, I go, hey, is it just us today? Mom says, well, we all knew the time in advance, don't worry, your brother's gonna be fine. Dad says, he's gonna be so mad, and smiles at mom. So the rest of us go and enjoy the movie, including our other brother. Then our parents take us out to lunch. We get back home around 2pm or something like that, and little brother comes practically running down the stairs, still in his stank ass clothes that haven't been washed, with tears in his eyes. He's screaming, how come you went without me? I wanted to see that movie too. Mom tells him, that really sucks, the other adults went to bed on time and you asked me not to treat you like a kid anymore. Sorry that you missed it, maybe if you ask your neighbors if they need their lawn mowed, you can make enough money to buy yourself a movie ticket and a bus ticket to get there. He just looked at her and cried harder. My little brother and my parents went to talk. Apparently my brother had cereal for lunch while we went to a sit down restaurant and he was really salty about that too. That night, my brother went to bed at 10pm sharp. As a bonus, mom taught him how to do his own laundry and basic cooking skills over the next month. He seemed happier, started thanking my mom on the time she did stuff for him, and my mom eventually told him that she was really proud, that he decided to be respectful of the rest of the family. My parents were so happy about this change in attitude that my mom took him and a friend to see the movie, and yes, it was still playing in the theater. Guys, I'd say that was a huge win for both the parents and the little brother. Perfect parenting malicious compliance to me, guys. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash malicious compliance. Guys, if you enjoyed the stories today, do hit that thumbs up. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, a Karen berates an officer for standing on her sidewalk, and she gets taught a lesson. Go check it out if you haven't, and myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next time. We love you.